when you were first dot com chat knocked on the door, what was it like? What was your first experience? Well, I thought he was going to spend a billion, but he spent £25,000. <laughs> I thought he was going to buy a 100 carat diamond, but he bought a 3 carat diamond. Really? Because those dot com people became so rich so fast that they didn't have a chance to, in fact, spend any money. Very often they never actually had it. It was all tied up in the companies, etc. It was a whole new thing. Clear. Yeah. And they were quite ordinary people. Quite ordinary people don't wear royal jewels. House of Breath is a jewellery and diamond company. We're based here in London with a flagship building in New Bond Street. But behind this building, there's a whole world of activity. It starts off in Johannesburg, where we're the leading producers of polished diamonds. We employ well over 200 people mm -hmm. that cut diamonds from the sites we have in Johannesburg. A site means a purchasing power from Beers on a regular basis, 10 times a year, we're allocated a certain amount of rough. In fact, we only sell large diamonds, and a large diamond is anything over a carat. The better quality diamonds all end up with us here, which means they get mounted into our jewellery. We make jewellery every day. We create non-stop. And unlike chain stores that might make a little single stone ring a thousand times, it's clear. practically everything we do is another design. They're all unique pieces. <laughs> now I can honestly say that at every level of this industry, I enjoyed what I was doing. When I was at the bench and I was working and my fingers were becoming sore, I actually enjoyed it. I couldn't wait to get in the morning and make those rings or whatever I was doing, repair jewellery or mount a diamond. I soon went on to uh, the handling of diamonds and then that was it. Once I touched a diamond, it was magical. I knew that I was meant for this industry. The first thing I can ever remember when I picked up a diamond, it was cold. And it was, a, it was bright and it was alive and it spoke to me. I looked at it and I thought I had an, an inherent understanding of this commodity. What happened with this uh, this boxer who happened to come into London that time when I was well, He was here. a very nice fellow and I, and I took a view. When I let him walk out of the shop with a million dollars of merchandise, he said he'll be paid. Well, I don't think a man with such a high profile wouldn't pay. And on his second visit to London, he walked into this showroom, he came to this desk where we're sitting, and he put his arms around me and kissed me, and I said, but Mike, you owe me money. <laughs> what? I owe you money? He never paid the son of a gun, white trash, etc., etc., etc. It was scary. <laughs> but nevertheless, within a few days, it was paid up. It was good publicity. When you have a name, you must never be afraid of the competition, because in fact, the competition is helping your name too. If you're not a brand, you're just out of it. And I don't think there's any room, really, in the, in the, in the big world, in the big picture, for people in, should we say, the retail business, because it is a retail business, without a name. And it does take time to create a name. Or a lot of money. Art is an expression. One ex the artist expresses himself in the medium that he works in, whether it's paint or sculpture or, or jewellery, if you like or a great architect, he's an artist. And it's expressing your personality and expressing your feelings. But, as you've seen with all the fashion houses, one seems to follow the other. That's because fashion is, is a word that's crept into art. And I sincerely believe in, in, in all the um, areas where art is, is a force, fashion is an element. And one has to follow the fashion Otherwise, you are way out, avant-garde, out of it, and maybe not successful. So you have to tie art to commercialism as well. You have to turn art into a profit, otherwise you can't exist. The greatest sale I ever made um, was when I had to meet somebody, and it ended up with talking to each other in mid-air, because he was a half-hour delayed. And this particular gentleman landed, we watched him land, our aircraft was already on the ground, it was in no man's land because we hadn't yet gone through customs, etc. I was able to get off my aircraft, walk over to his aircraft, his ladder came up for security, he was a very important figure, 
and we made a deal on his aircraft on the runway uh, for multi millions of dollars. The commodity was left on his plane, which he put into the safe which he had on his plane. He took off and went back to his country. We did make more and more important pieces in the Brunei explosion, for sure. When I compare the quality that we have sold there compared to the quality of the crown jewels, for instance, yes. the English crown jewels or the Iranian crown jewels or whatever have you, there is nowhere, no place on earth where there are better creations and better quality stones. Every stone is certified, usually D flawless or at least D or E color. Recently, we, uh, we cut the largest D-color, flawless, brilliant diamond in the world. How many carats was that? Well, it finished off at just 91 carats, 90 carat 97, and there were satellite stones from the rough. But we acquired the rough from De Beers. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we designed the stones that we wanted to get out of the rough, or were able to get out of the rough. We cut the stone, we had a ceremony in Monte Carlo, and we sold the stone within 24 hours. It was one of the world's most valuable diamonds.